There's a lot of reasons to love Chainsaw Man. It's kinetic, ever-evolving pace, the sheer lunacy on display that sits between absurd and occasionally frightening, to the near constant string of open-mouthed what-the-f*** moments that looking at that title of Chainsaw Man feels like it was built from someone who listened to a little too much Linkin Park back in the day. Why the need for so much gruesome graphic violence? Why not let us imagine Because it's a little so bit? much fun, Chan! To cut a long story short, I really like this series. There's a particular vibe that has kept me invested after a third consecutive read-through of Part 1, right up to the currently ongoing Part 2, where even the chapter names carry this zany energy where picking just one to analyze is kind of a challenge. There's Chapter 5. All you do is talk about some fish titties. Say something else. Chapter 44. Boom, 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 boom. I want you in my room. 69. Oh. Nice. And of course, Chapter 81. We don't talk about Chapter 81 in this house, but out of all of the insane, upsetting, or occasionally beautiful panels, there's one I keep coming back to. It's this one. Up until this point, I've been using all these big, hyperbolic terms to describe the manga, all of which are true, but then there's this one. It's reserved, quiet, and a word that at first glance doesn't seem like it would fit into the author's dictionary. Subtle. The scene is from chapter 39 called Tearjerker. It comes right at the end of the fourth major story arc, a stretch that was filled with a lot of fighting, death, and a really funny bit where they repeatedly kick the villain in the balls. Only for it to end here, in this theater with Makima crying, having the same blank expression she had moments ago. Out of all the things she has done and will go on to do later in the story, why does this one small panel hit so hard? There's a few elements that stand out immediately, such as the use of lighting, with the key source of the cinema screen illuminating her face in full detail in comparison to many of the fight scenes which employ a more scratchy, frantic quality to the artwork. There's also a stillness that gives the image a more solid, tactile feel, and the more I stare at this panel, I keep wondering why does it have this invisible control? Like, any time I look at it, it draws me in, but I can't really explain why it is. I think to answer this question, we need to go back to one of those words I used. Because it's actually more prevalent than you'd think, and more specifically, the author who employs it. That word is subtlety. And that author... is this guy. Born into the lost decade of 1992, Tatsuki Fujimoto, who was the man levitating in the previous clip, is a strange fellow. Here's him singing about his favorite food. I don't really have a place to put this, I just think it's cute and wholesome. Not having access to any local preparatory schools, he spent a lot of his youth attending paint classes alongside his grandparents, which eventually led to him studying Western-style painting later in his university. By his own admission, he often talked about not being as good as his fellow classmates. Given that there is so little information about him, that feeling of isolation and rejection of societal norms seems to be a prevalent theme throughout his body of work. Whether it's Mitaka, the mysterious shut-in offer Kyoimoto, or the young girl's son from his previous series Fire Punch, which I've just started reading and it's more like the 30 seconds to Mars in comparison to Chainsaw's Linkin Park because, yikes, my dude, there is some stuff in there that will not get this video monetized. Oh, by the way, I'm about halfway to getting monetized, so, um, would you like to subscribe? I can't believe I've come to this point, I'm actually asking for likes and subscribes. But easily one of the biggest influences on Fujimoto's style of writing comes not from the world of manga, but instead Korean cinema. And more specifically, 2008's The Chaser. An unorthodox thriller that subverts many of the typical genre conventions by having the central antagonist captured by the 30 minute mark, which leaves the remaining runtime as a blank canvas for the story to go in any direction at once. It's that kind of chaotic, unpredictable energy which is felt throughout this man's body of work. From his one-shots to his serialized projects, they are all laser-focused on taking an established mood and go, Fuck it! Let's have some fun! I previously mentioned Chapter 44 as I feel like it has this formula down to a science in how well it sets up the scene in question, and then pays it off with one of those loaded WTF bombs which makes it so exciting. So you see, 
that's where the trouble began. That smile. That damn smile. Let's start off with the layout of this scene. There's an invisible guiding line to comics as a storytelling medium. Like, bad panel placement can actively hurt how a scene is constructed, while great ones give a sense of rhythm which feels organic to the reader. So when you're building your visual language, there should be a clear sense of each panel being specifically motivated. In this case, every panel, whether it's a wide shot or a close-up, is all framed at an eye level, designed to place us directly in the middle of this exchange. The choice of said panels changes with the flow of the conversation. When Rize confesses her feelings feelings for Denji, with her backlit by the white light of the night sky, only in the following panels to fall into a more muted tone when Denji struggles to return those same feelings back. We get these tight shots near the bottom of the page as the awkwardness of the conversation builds up, before a few choice words, we get this double page spread of them kissing. In comparison to the other time this happened, that was… definitely something, this panel just captures this intimate moment and the pages that follow just let us take it in, like the world is still going by, but all that matters in this moment is them. Then she bites off his tongue and proceeds to blow up. Did that last bit throw you off? Well, yeah, that's kind of his style. The reason I spent so much time setting the stage for that reveal is because Fujimoto takes his time setting up a tone for a scene then paying it off in that pure moment of spectacle which I like to dub as the vibe panel. Trademark. Whether it comes after a long dialogue exchange or even a stretch of silence, he has this ability to capture this raw feeling without a sense of artifice that might have been lost in a more, let's say, traditionally shonen looking art style that so many series in the publication aim for. That's the thing with Chainsaw Man, like, at first glance, it looks like everything it says on the cover, but everything is made up of two sides, whether it's the juxtaposition of the manga itself being loud and quiet, characters like Aki who boast this cold, uptight demeanor at first that slowly fades away with the newfound family that's thrust upon them, or maybe it's the sides of ourselves we show when we're around certain people. Let's go back to Makima. The first time we see her, we don't see her face. It actually takes two whole pages to give us a proper look at the head of Japan's devil hunting organization, and it's clear there's something off about this person. Despite being a core part of the main cast and having a presence in nearly every chapter, we really don't see Makima, or more specifically, we don't see much genuine emotion. Almost every situation she goes into, any problem that is faced, is all dealt with this cold, calculated efficiency, like she's rehearsed for any and all possible outcomes. On the surface, this performance looks convincing. She loves dogs, enjoys movies, and coughs when trying to smoke her first cigarette. But it's covered in this push for perfection. It's felt in her speech, the way she sits, and this condescending attitude on those who are supposedly beneath her. That's right, a gaslighting, gatekeeping girl boss. You know the feeling, right? We put on different faces when we're around different individuals, whether it's a friend or a co-worker, maybe a family member. There's a level of intimacy that will vary in these relationships, but there is a connection we share with those around us. In some way, we are all searching for approval, maybe admiration from other people, and that's the scary thing about Makima. She is that very real human desire, but to be the one in charge, to have the leash in her hand, a world with no imperfections, no flaws, no bad movies. Which ironically would lead to her undoing as she vents all her hatred and disdain towards who she thinks is Denji, who from the beginning never really took the time to know him. When they go on that cinema date, they see free movies, and throughout the experience, Denji is constantly looking at other people's reaction in the screening, wondering why he isn't getting anything. Makima's observations, on the other hand, are more on a surface level, like there needs to be an objective reason for why this doesn't work. She's probably the kind of person who says elevated horror unironically. Then we come to the last villain, 
Now, I'm not aware if this was inspired by any specific work, especially given Fujimoto's clear love for other manga and classical paintings. Like, I know I said I wouldn't talk about Chapter 81, but I'm gonna break this rule once. The fall of Lucifer is seen clearly in Makima's apartment just before she opens the door. I wouldn't be surprised if the film in question wasn't pulled from somewhere. The scene doesn't have anything grand or epic. It's just two people hugging, and both Denji and Makima cry. There isn't a rhyme or reason to it, they just feel it. There's an argument to be made that this is manipulation, yes, but aren't all stories a form of emotional manipulation? The movie showed two people quietly embracing in a simple, true expression of a loving connection. Something that Makima, despite all her power and desire, will never truly have. If you were to boil art down into its purest form, it's about eliciting emotion from others. At the end of the day, quality isn't important, it's the feeling you get from it. Chainsaw Man makes you feel so many things. We come to it for the spectacle, its unhinged, broken characters and the absurdity. But beyond the blood and guts, we stay for the genuine beating heart underneath. That's why this quiet moment of silent acceptance is one of my favourites in contemporary manga. This is the work of someone who never quite fit in, putting their weird ideas out there into the world for everyone to see. And I for one, can't wait to see where it takes me next.